I do this kind of swirl wear, and basically it's colored clay, and I don't too often, except on this one, mix white in with it. But this is the original swirl wear. Before I moved up here, I lived in uh, Catawba Valley in North Carolina, and I brought a couple books, um, and the two potters, let's see, three potters, this potter I don't think is in the book, but uh, this is Charlie Lisk, who's a wild, crazy guy, and he's there, and he has his MFA, and he's out in the country as a groundhog kiln. I brought a few photos of a groundhog kiln, and basically, there's handouts for everybody if you don't have one, and basically, in the Catawba Valley, um, potters set up there in the early 1800s. And for about 60 years, they made utilitarian wear, crocs and things for molasses and liquor. And, uh, but because of glass and canning, uh, the utilitarian wear, just people weren't buying it anymore. And um, so, and I can remember, this is potter named Berlin Craig, and he's on that poster right up there. And I met him and talked to him, and he was a very interesting man, but he was one of the, he was, I think, the last one in North Carolina, the last uh, uh, just folk potter uh, who was doing swirl wear and face jugs. So what they started doing in about 1870 is they started making pieces that would attract people to buy them because they were pretty and decorative. So they started making swirl wear. So they take their dark clay body and a white clay body and mix them together. So this, this is Berlin Craig's face jug, and he made this when he was probably 85. He, I bought this from him probably in 2000, 2000 and he died in 2002. Uh, Charlie's still kicking, and he's wonderful. If you ever go to uh, Catawba Valley in North Carolina, go see him. This is from Seagrove, and this is swirl wear. You can especially see it on the inside. This is two clay bodies, but then after they finished throwing it, when it was leather hard, they carved through it, mm -hmm. and you get some really interesting pieces. Um, these two pieces and the original Catawba Valley potters, what they would do is they would take three things. They would take hardwood ash, clay, which they usually dug from a, uh, a clay mine in their yard, um, uh, or thereabouts, and then the uh, third thing is powdered glass. And if you happen to look, this is just glass. If if I were to take a, a glass bottle, just different glass bottles, Incredible. and pulverize them, that those three ingredients. And so burning um, the groundhog kiln, you get lots of wood ash. Mm -hmm. They dug the clay, and they would take old bottles, like these three jars, they would just take those, and put them in a pit. Um, Berlin, I saw his, and what his was, he had a glass crusher, and it was as long as these two tables, and it was in a stream. And so basically, the stream would run through and fill up a wooden box with water. There was a weight on the other end, and when the weight, when the weight of the water got to a certain point, it would go like this, and it would crunch, and 24-7, it's probably still running, it ran 24-7 every day, and they would just refill bottles, and then they'd take it out and screen it, so that's what that is. So basically, they paid nothing for, because they used the wood ash, and they, um, so, and then they just screen all three, mix them in proportions, and then screen it, and usually it was just a handful of this and a handful of that. So that's how they made their glazes. Um, Actually, I'm using a home 10 porcelain, and so this is just a white porcelain. It looks funky because I got an old bag and it has a little bit of mold in it, but it's a, a really bright white. This is an English porcelain. And yesterday I came in in the morning and I mixed up uh, this colored clay that we're going to use today. So these are the colors, and um, basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to do several, I'm going to do three techniques, and if you want, um, I'll even, I've got my, I've got my torch, so I can do this one too. I mean, it is incredible how you could, if, if I had taken this piece, and when it was leather hard, cut through it, mm -hmm. it's amazing the, the designs that you can get, and this is such an easy way to work with clay. 
And for those of you who don't like to glaze or aren't into glazing, but you love working with clay, working with colored clay is fabulous because it looks really nice unglazed, but you just put a clear glaze on it or a celadon, you know, and they're really beautiful. The, the teeth are made of um, old porcelain plates. They have to be high fired because these go in the ground, ground. This one in the groundhog kiln. But, uh, and you're welcome to pick them up. I mean, they're, uh, they're pots that I love because of the memories. Um, and they're lovely pots. Hi, Rowena. No, it's okay. And, um, <clears throat> but they're old porcelain plates. And what you do is you just break up with a hammer mm. a couple porcelain plates and then uh, just keep a little bowl of the broken up little pieces. And then when you throw the piece, then it seems like you cut them though. I mean, they're pretty. You just, you know, you, you would just put them into the clay. Yeah. And because these fire as high or higher than this, they will just stay. I okay. never have had one. I've got a planter at home that I did in earthenware, and uh -huh. I did this and made a face on it. Um, the origin of uh, face jugs, you know, some people will say it might have been German because the Catawba Valley was settled by Germans in the early 1800s. But um, I think from the reading I've done that it actually came from Africa and uh, that these were grave markers in, in Africa to, to ward off evil spirits uh, on a grave. One is $8.61 and I'll probably use about a third of it. So you're using a couple dollars worth of stain for probably about four pounds of clay. So it, but it will last for many months if you keep them under plastic and you keep them wet. So um, what I want to do is I have these little tiny plastic cups and a plastic spoon, and then I have my stain. And the first thing I'm going to do is put my dough mixer together. Hi, pumpkin. Hi, sweetie. This is the dough mixer, and um, it's a wonderful little machine. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to come over here, get some water in my cup. This stainless steel sink is fabulous. I'm going to put two and a half. I eyeball it. If I were doing this as the only... Um, the only thing that I did, and I didn't do a lot of other types of clay work, I would get the this clay body powdered. I'd weigh it out, and I would know, you know, whether I'm putting three percent, eight percent, two percent of the dry stain. So it would just be an extra step of weighing the dry powdered clay porcelain and weighing this. So there's that. So I'm going to put this here. And something I found out yesterday that I didn't know was that I um, got lazy at, when I mixed the fourth batch of colored clay. I was tired. And so the last one, I put this in first. And the others, I was putting in a little bit of the clay, putting this on top, thinking if I sandwiched you know, in between, that it would mix better, but it actually mixes better if I do, if I put the wet in the bottom. Here, this is 550 porcelain, it's a home 10 porcelain. And I'm gonna use most of this. So this is the 550 porcelain, and because it's expensive, um, the porcelain's expensive plus the mm -hmm. stains are expensive, I just kind of wipe. I want to use it as much as I can. And I'm pulling off little pieces of clay. And then, this is so nice, because I just do this. I will, while I'm doing this for a few minutes, I'm going to explain how you would do it by hand. Online, you can go, and there's a video that Barbara Costanza did um, 
of my doing this by hand. And what I do is I take a piece of clay that's probably three pounds and I put a hole in it, open it up like a pinch pot. And then I would take the, the wet, the water and the stain, put it in there and then over the sink, I would mush it in together and then wedge it in. It takes usually 45 minutes to an hour and a half to do that. Um, and this is just so much easier. This summer I had a class in colored porcelain and when I realized I was going to be mixing up about 16 colors, I went to the store and I got a dough mixer. So I'm going to take this off real quick and just show you so you can see the inside of this. And so the, the stains in the bottom, it's just so using it dry though, the colorant without adding water. What is the, because before when I did this with a different potter that he didn't have that water step. He just, he just put it, you actually I would put it, it on the be, clay and we worked it and in. And worked it in. I would think it would be harder to get it all the way through. The, because what the water does, it lubricates actually the clay. I end up with, I mean, I don't put much water in. I put a tablespoon, maybe a tablespoon and a half of water. But that then um, goes in there and it works through better. I think I would spend a lot more time, a lot more time. But if you want, but that's a great idea too, because if, I mean, you try it all. Um, because if you do that, you can get some nice speckles. I made all those Actually, for yesterday. Speckle. Huh? It did speckle. Yeah. And so, and these sometimes will speckle if, the best thing to do is make them at least a week ahead of time. And then it will disperse and then you take them out and you wedge them again. These were made yesterday so I could very well have some speckling. I don't mind speckling, you know, so much. Um, but. It would depend on what the project was that I was making. Okay, so this is gonna not take long. Can I just add a little bit as we go? Question: The colorants. Um, kind I ask? The colorants. We know. Because um, the stains do come out fairly true to their beginning color, but there is a chart, and there are some stains that say they're for body, and others that say they're for glazes or underglazes or ongoves. I use them all and then I test them. Mm -hmm. And what I would do is I normally would take the ones I did yesterday, make a little coin, mm -hmm. put a, the number on it, and fire it. When you work in colored clay, you will find that when you bisque it, it looks washed out. Like mm -hmm. there's very, very, very little color there. And then you fire it up to its mm -hmm. vitrifying, its maturing temperature, and that color just bursts out at you. It's really beautiful. So, and if you use, you can look at those bowls and you will see that on the bottom where they sat on the kiln mm -hmm. shelf, they're not glazed. And honestly, a lot of times I much prefer the color unglazed uh, to glazed because the shine right. sometimes takes so mm -hmm. away from the right. pattern. and it right. looks like this. So do you have it on a low or a high speed? I have it on a low speed. What they recommend for heavy... That's <laughs> true. What they recommend, what they recommend for, for uh, heavy doughs is not above two. So there's one. There's two. What I do, what I did yesterday, is I just clean the dough hook, 
take it off, take this off, take it apart. This was worth every penny I spent for it, which was about $180, which I did, maybe it was 220 I'm not sure. What I find is good about this machine, I can't remember what it is. I'm sorry, Barbara, I know I'm, I think it's a Bodum. Mm -hmm. What I like about this machine is it has that shield mm -hmm. because it's one thing if dough gets in there, but it's another if it's clay that gets into any of the um, mechanisms, the engine or up here, you know. But this stays fairly clean. That was the one thing when I bought it, I thought, am I being foolish? More colored clay people mm -hmm. because it's fascinating. I spiral wedge, which looks like it has a spiral here. Mm -hmm. It's an oriental Japanese method. I don't, this is the bull's head, like this. This wears you out, wears you out. So uh, it took me about three weeks to get used to this. And what you do is you bring it up on its tail and go down and up and down. And it's weird because you're pushing in here and down here at the same time. Any questions? It also works better with large amounts of clay, right? Like if you're throwing a five or six or seven pound. Yeah, I think this is about four and a half, that. maybe five pounds of clay. Hmm. And so you're right. It, you can get your hands, and you have very large hands. So um, you uh, will want to work with some. You wouldn't want to work with a little tiny piece. This is hard to do at 10 pounds. You know, but. Basically, I put one foot in front of me, and I rock my whole body, and that will help you because I usually wedge 100 times. One. <laughs> <laughs> I jump ahead. Two. Or oh, count by tens. <laughs> count by tens. There you go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 20, 40, 65, and can you use different things um, to, there are several types of stains. There's metal oxides, copper, cobalt, iron, manganese, ilmenite for speckles, red iron oxide. All those work great. They're very earthy and beautiful. You get a little bit more speckling, and so what I would say is if you want to do that, give at least two weeks for it to sit after you've mixed it completely. Let it sit for about two weeks under a lot of plastic, really tight, no air, and then come back and wedge it another hundred times. And then go ahead and use it. Because the oxides, the metal oxides, have a tendency to be coarser. The mason stains are fabulous. Um, they can get expensive, but you know, today I used I can't remember how much it was, maybe $8. I used a third of that. So $250 to $3 to do, let's say, five pounds of clay. And you will find, you know, it goes pretty quickly, the clay, unless you're making small things. The second thing is the mason stains. There's a number of the mason stains that burn out. I'm going to take this clay up to cone 10. And so I do not use usually any pinks lavenders, reds, plums, but if I want to, well, because they will burn out and they'll just turn kind of this off-white. The color is what they call fugitive. It just leaves uh, because it can't go that high. But there are colorants and they're more expensive. They're by a German company called Degusa and they're uh, encapsulated. And so they, there are brilliant oranges and pinks and reds um, that you can get uh, and some, I don't think any lavenders. But what I would do is find your color palette and test them. Just do a little bit, just do a, a tiny amount and go ahead and uh, test it and see if it's going to be fugitive. Because you don't want to spend a lot of money on something that you would not be able to use, okay? So if you can buddy up with somebody and do a lot of testing. You can use it for earthenware, a white earthenware. 
you can do, and then I, almost every color will come out true to the chart. Um, the cone five, six, almost everything, like 95% will come out. Um, but it's always best to, to test. I mean, it's, it takes extra time and it's a four letter word, but you know, testing is really crucial. So basically you can, um, Bonnie, what is the name of the little, I just slipped my mind, the little uh, bottles of underglaze. The velvets. Now, well, the velvets, but then there's the other ones. That, concepts. The concepts. concepts. Concepts are great. Thank you very much. But you're paying for the water. You're paying mm -hmm. for the water. And so, um, and it takes a lot more because you also have all the additives they've put in there, the suspenders and all that kind of stuff. You don't, so, it's going to burn out. Some of the concepts will flux too. Yes, and they will flux. So Great you point. Have to be careful with those. So, and everybody knows what flux means. It will start to, um, when a glaze fluxes, when it melts. And so they will, they don't always come out um, like the stain, they won't come out like the stains. If It depends upon the concentration. And I should take a minute and talk about black because black is really difficult and to get to the proper consistency where, you know, I might mix a black and it will be like Rowena's jacket. And that is the perfect thing. You want to get that beautiful, clear black. And then I might mix it and want that deep color and I'll get gray, you know? And so for me, if I want to use black, because it's expensive, it takes a lot, um, I will do a lot of testing on the black in increments, how much to put in. Because not only do you want that clear black, maybe for outlining or something, but also, if you get too much, it will blister and bloat and ruin everything around it. So, and this was just mixed yesterday, so it might have a few little speckles and things in it. This is um, an interesting way to make the stripes. Um, I have the third method I'm gonna do is the method I usually do for throwing just bowls um, with stripes. But this is an interesting thing. So I'm just going to center it. Just going to center it. Oh, it matches my mark properties. Yeah. Okay. Then I'm going to put a hole in the middle. Go down, just like I would. I'm like I'm throwing a regular ball. Coming up the inside. Just going to cut out places here. How many do I have? Anybody counting? No. <laughs> All right. Got every one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Wow. Stripes. Yeah. You know, yeah. by doing it this way. And true to me, I, if, if I wanted to do this and be very precise and wanted it to come out um, like a stoop in the vase or something, I, I would take the time, wait for this to dry up a little bit. Um, but all I'm worried about is that the two colors mm -hmm. are approximately the same um, moisture content mm -hmm. for that. So I'm just going to get medium dry. Okay, so now let's see what happens. Who wants to throw this? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I like it when you spin it. 
Is it pretty? Is it pretty? As long as they don't come flying out at everybody. <laughs> That's always a possibility in my room. I'll put my single color on the inside. And I'm going to just kind of take a minute and push those in so I don't have a lot of air. Um, that technique over there that you asked me about, Teresa, they, it's even throughout the color, the striations. And this one is when you want just a clear, a, one color on the mm -hmm. inside. I feel an air bubble. How's it look? Oh! <laughs> like, how does it have a funky sound to it? Oh, it's a big air bubble right here. The first time I worked with colored clay, it wasn't the making of the piece that I was thrilled, it was the trimming. Because when you trim is when the colors come out. So the inside, I'm just going to open this up. A bead, a bead. They'll come through. Yeah, they'll come through when I trim. And I, I am hoping, I mean, normally I would just leave it like this and then come back in a day or two and trim it. But I think I can trim this um, here because I have my torch. I would wait a couple days, trim this, trim a regular foot on it, and I'd have the pattern. But then I would let it dry until it was uh, bone hard. And then I would take quadruple aught um, steel wool and then I would go over it, over a trash can or a sink or something, and you go over that and it will make it like an eggshell mm -hmm. and the colors will be really dynamic. But I never, I wouldn't use a green scrubby because the green scrubby is gonna put its color into it and the green scrubby is too coarse. So four zero uh, steel wool is wonderful. Suppose you ribbed that now. You could, yep, you could. That's why I have my rib here and I can do that. But, um, but if I trim it, uh, if I take a minute and, and dry it a little bit and trim it, then it, you'll see a little bit more definition, I hope. And is the steel wool um, you to try absolutely everything but there are clay bodies that a lot of clay bodies have different treatment rates so if you're using the same clay body you pretty much know that these these two are going to go together and what I'm doing is I'm rolling three coils of colored of the contrasting clay and I'm going to wrap these around the outside all the way around the outside of this I'm going to do it in one pattern but there are so many patterns you could do. You could wrap it around all different ways. How's that? Beads. <laughs> Something a child would make in second grade, doesn't it? <laughs> I was thinking about, you know, wrapping things in yarn for like Christmas tree balls and stuff the way you're doing that. It's the same process. The, the thing is, is, you know, you could take twine and wrap around here and then make a pinch pot. I've done that and that's lovely. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Oh, bless me.
doing this, and I am going to consciously put the place where I put all the coils together here down. Okay, ready, set. Okay. It just seems so elemental, right? Like, you know. <laughs> What you, if you want definite wide stripes, you don't want to bring it up and down like wedging on the wheel very much. I mean, I could do this like 10 times up and down, and I'd have very thin, nice stripes. Yeah, a lot of very thin striations. One color on the inside. <laughs> when you think about trimming these, when you have several colors on the inside and several on the outside, you want to use a trimming tool or a, or a sharp rib and if you're going to do that you don't want to make fancy pots because they're harder to trim because there was a time when I would make real fancy um, lifts or I would you know put texture in it and you just it takes forever to get the color to pop out of anything that you're going to do with a lot of like um, texture so and it's kind of nice because I thought of that when I, you see how this is kind of pointy up here. It's, that even is a pain to trim. So I would normally just take this and flatten it a little bit. Any, you see, you really think any ins and outs, any ribs, throwing ribs. You know, trying so to get really rid. you're just going to trim the entire surface a little bit. I, on this one, out. I will trim the inside and out. Inside too. Yeah, yeah. If it's got multiple colors, now if it doesn't like that first one I did, it didn't have multiple colors on the inside, so I won't, oh, right, I won't but trim. Right, you it inside, right? Mm-hmm, mm -hmm. So if I, I mean, down, I can see I've got a little bit here. So I'm going to take this rib and try and make this nice and even on the inside. And there's only the one color basically on the inside except halfway down. And then here, I'm going to try and get rid of my throwing rings. So this is almost the, I mean, swirl means, swirl wear means swirl. So this one, I'm going to use my trimming tool to cut through this and carve it. It's like a Starburst from the sun. What colors do you guys sun. like more? The teal and the other one or this one? Which bowl would you eat from? Now, porcelain has a high percentage of uh, shrinkage, 15%. That's a lot. That's a lot. So um, I'm going to do this in three steps. Throw it, and then I'm going to um, trim it on the wheel with uh, my trimming tool. And then I'm going to wait, and the very last thing I'll do is carve it. Oh, I'm sorry, Pumpkin, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to ask you if you ever thought of something fun to do with the pretty scraps? Yeah, I would take them and just mush them up and then make beads. Mm -hmm. oh. Okay. Here we go. It's one heck of a big bead. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. <laughs> 
Like so, you should juggle that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or you try to wear it. <laughs> <laughs> you look okay. at behind you on this page. Think of all the variables here. I can put it this way. I can put it this way. This way. This way. Sideways. You know, all different ways. But we'll do just a basic Berlin throw. And I want to look just to make sure I don't have big crack or anything all right there before I put it down. I don't know, maybe five and a half pounds of clay, I would think, something like that. So because we've done wide stripes, I'm going to work this up and down a few times. Now think of the variables. If I don't work the bottom down a lot, but I work the top, I would have you know, many, many uh, lines, striations on the top, and just a few on the bottom. Or vice versa, which would be more difficult. So. And to think, it, to me, it feels weird that swirl wear that we make today. I mean, there aren't that many potters doing the, you know, 1920, 19, you know, oh. 1880 technique of, you know, two earthy colors. Now it's turned into a, hey, let's use white clay. And I probably took it up five times, up and down five times to get this nice swirl. I kind of just like just the top of it, the way it looks now. And then I'm going to take my thumbs. It's exciting to throw with this, too. And I'm going to take my fingers and go down inside. I've made two bowls, so I'm not going to make another bowl. Yeah, that one I kept. You know why? Because I just love that. You yeah. Know, that it's got a little dot. How did that happen? That accidentally? It was accidentally. <laughs> yeah. It was this technique. Yeah. Okay. It was this That's technique. We were, we were right. Yeah. 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 But every once in a while, you get one. I made probably 30 of these for empty bowls. Well, you can look on the bottom of those and see what year I made them. 2002 or three or four, somewhere in there. Oh, one. One. Oh, yeah, when I, I first got you. I just saw you do something that seemed unconventional to me. And that was that you pressed down and you pulled the pug out from the middle. I did Is because that I, air. I want to make sure I don't have any air. So a lot of times, if I put a that's a great, another great question. <laughs> <laughs> that if you know because I do it unconsciously when I've put several pieces of clay yeah. together, I'll go down in the middle. But then when I oh mm -hmm. I kind of open it up because I want that very middle to pop up because a lot of times there'll be two or three air bubbles in there. Mm -hmm. And that is just a pain in the behind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So So that's the way of getting the air bubbles cutting you're basically cutting the air bubbles mm -hmm. out. Yeah, and you know I don't know. I mean I slapped it together pretty yeah. hard. But this, you know, will also make the uh, yeah, beads. <laughs> beads and buttons and bows. Bees and buttons and bows, yeah. I'm big on beads. I probably have a thousand beads at home I made from our summer class, you know, all the leftover pieces. Are you paying attention at all to the color changes now or because the slips all around that you're just making your pot? And I'm looking at the paint? inside more than anything okay. and you can see the inside has a oh, lot of wow. color. Yeah, you know, it has a lot of color on the inside. A lot of stripes on the inside. Can you see? Mm -hmm. Very good. Yeah. And they'll be on the outside too when you take the slip off. Oh yeah. I mean, right now it just looks like you know one color, a maybe a, a, a little bit of slurry. other clay. But it's the it's the clay. Slip. It's like I always like to give the basics mm -hmm. and then let everybody kind mm -hmm. of fly with that because. It doesn't matter. You you know, there's maybe ten of you here today, and if let's say six people work in in colored clay at some point, you know, you're gonna you're gonna come up with your way to do it. And so here I've got the stripes, and these stripes 
almost seem to go all the way around. Mm -hmm. You see the difference? Yep. This isn't that spiraling yeah. up. <clears throat> I, would, I would say that there's like the lagoon plays 60, 65, 70, 75, 80. And 90. Those are the ones. Are the, all the base same clay body with different minerals in there to make them a little bit different. And those so, are the ones I used, Barbara. Are, are they? Yeah. yeah. So they're basically the same base. So you're using the same foundation um, for that. Okay. So I'm going to take, I'm going to bow this out more into a base because I think I said I'd make a base. Um, kind of rough on the inside, but that's okay. I'm going to close it in enough you won't know. <laughs> Any more questions? I mean, you guys have asked fabulous uh, questions, and I would say if you want to work in colored clay, go for it. It's, it's very rewarding. I mean, extremely rewarding as far as um, the no, Barbara, what, um, satisfaction level. So the, now this to me has a different look. It's mm -hmm. more of a around the outside. Yeah, look up to it. And um, I don't think if I carved this one that it would be near as interesting as that bowl oh. that I'm going to go over it's there and carve in a minute. Yeah. yeah. Now, if you brought that up and down a few more times, the, the, oh, the would variations be would be thinner, right? Mm -hmm. Come up mm -hmm. through, there'd mm -hmm. be more of them. Mm -hmm. I actually thought I was surprised at how wide these are because, I mean, I already had two wide ones. You know, I'm like, I don't want to get a little thin one going there, but. Pots is wonderful. Anybody going to NC? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Oh, you got. Yeah, Mary Pat's going, Bonnie's going. Yeah. It's now that I put that thing in there, it's a uh, Bonnie's going. Johnny? Yeah. And probably, I would imagine, Joanne Ashford's going. Jill Kowachik will probably be there. In fact, maybe she'll. She had a booth in uh, Rhode Island. Who was that? Joanne. Oh, yeah. Not Joanne, uh, Jill. Yeah. Got my bong, Jay. Randy. Randy? Yeah. yeah. I haven't seen any of the demonstrators yet, but have you seen the schedule? Uh huh. They oh. just pretty much put out, it's, I Did think, still working on it, but okay, it's, okay. it's pretty good. There's a lot of like digital stuff, which I don't have much interest in, but there, but there's a, a, a number of wood firing. What, what about you, Bonnie? Did you look at the schedule? I have tried to pull it up and I haven't. Yeah, no, I haven't had any luck yet. I didn't have any luck. Okay. I know through other conversations, Jessica Putnam Phillips is supposed to be oh. demonstrating. Oh, well, she's going to demonstrate? Good, yeah. good, good. She's local. Jessica is great. Isn't, Isn't she? Funny. She does. Oh, and she's I love super. her studio. That one's not bad either. So let's um, play. try carving each one of them. Why not? You know? <laughs> and see, you know, what they, what they look like. Um, and what the difference is. So this was our first technique. Who remembers how we did this? All of those two bees in the hole. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. How many people, which technique did you like the best? I like the last one. Yeah, the last I like one? The well, I also like that. This one? I do. Yeah, I like the, the, I do. Red brown. the other one's a little bit too um, wild animal. Mm -hmm. It's kind of cool. Like, like a zebra. Stripes are really, mm -hmm. yeah. I definitely kids would love that. Mm -hmm. you know. Design to form and then throwing it. No, but I think that's what um, Lee, Lee is going to do in Say that advanced again. class. Doing what? You take um, colored clay and you make designs. <clears throat> and then you take really thin slices mm -hmm. of it mm -hmm. and you oh. put it on to and the laminate outside it, yeah. of a oh. partially oh. thrown piece. Laminate it with a roller, you put it on, and then you throw it. Is that the wow. note? What's the one you make into the square neck? What is it? It starts with an N. Um, Narakomi. 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 And, you um, make it and there's the Mishima. Yeah. yeah. No, but the one where they take, the, they keep putting the different color slabs together. Um, 
and then you cut them down. Just think of those as inlay side. Oh, oh, the inlay colored porcelain thing? No, no, no it's something else. Yeah, well, that's what it's called. And then they, and then they, um, you know, roll them out. So they can go. You can go on YouTube and you can find, you know, lots of different. Yes, and see what kind of carving you personally like. No, you don't have to carve it at all. But the thing is, is a lot of times these really end up being it up, pretty yeah. quick, yeah. thick. Yeah. And it really brings it out. Mm -hmm. And then you can do also the flat. Oops, got an air bubble there. Not anymore. <laughs> Cut it off. So, and this is fairly thick, so when you guys get to carving it, you can carve pretty pretty deep on this, I think. Beads. <laughs> Need some buttons and bows. But this one, oh, that one is okay. Okay. And see how these, yeah. see how it's like. <clears throat> yep. So now you guys. <coughs> take